Hey there, I'm Jesse, and you're listening to the Deep Lore Boys Podcast, where me, Matthew, and Jackson delve into the random, rare, and often ridiculous pieces of human history. So he went out and stole a plane, and he landed it in the street outside the bar. There was a rooster, and they ended up burning him at the stake. He was on display for a long time. And everyone thought he was wax? Yep, they thought he was a wax sculpture. So, uh, y'all know Top Gun, right? They just came out with a new Top Gun movie yeah. this year. Haven't seen it. Haven't seen the original. I don't need to. Whatever Tom Cruise does in Top Gun, it is dwarfed by the skill and prowess of Thomas Fitzpatrick. He was nicknamed Tommy Fitz, and basically one time in 1956, he got real drunk and made a bet to a buddy of his that he could travel from New Jersey to New York in 15 minutes. So he went out and stole a plane <laughs> and flew it <laughs> into the city. What into a the city lad. by night at like 3 a.m. he did this. And he landed it in the street outside the bar. Wait, <laughs> and <laughs> he landed it in New York City in a bar? Like, Well, no, no he didn't like kamikaze the bar. <laughs> he just, just he like, landed no, no. on the street right outside. Mad respect. What type of plane was this? It was a single engine plane from the Tetterboro School of Aeronautics in uh, New Jersey. Um, but the owner of the plane refused to press charges. <laughs> yeah, <they did. laughs> and he was like, no, nah, that was cool. And the New York Times called the flight a feat of aeronautics and a fine landing. Yeah, he literally, he was fined a hundred bucks for it. I don't know. That what would it. that have been at the time? A thousand it was bucks. about a thousand dollars in 2021. So not great, but then again, you know, for hijacking a plane. <laughs> and, wait, wait a second. Into a city. Wait a second. Hold up. Can I say this one on the podcast? For hijacking a plane and flying it into New York City. Uh, all I'm saying, <laughs> uh, guys. Uh, I'm saying, don't think this one, en- on this one ended a whole lot better than the other one. <laughs> all, this is a happy ending. Is all I'm saying. Quite frankly, if he didn't crash the plane, was like the person that owned the plane even offended? Like I wouldn't have even been offended. Yeah, the person that owned it refused to press charges. Yeah, he was like, you know, that's just that's just how that goes. Honestly, I wouldn't. I'd be like, wow, my plane went on an adventure today. Like my plane went on an adventure. (laughs) adventure. (laughs) As long as the guy pays for the gas, I don't care. No, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the other half of the story because he did it again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> on, on October 4th, 1958, so two years later, just before 1 a.m., he got drunk again and stole another plane from the same airfield and landed on Amsterdam and 187th Street in front of a Yeshiva University building after <laughs> another guy didn't believe his first feat. He was like, nah, no way like, you nah, landed a plane <laughs> in the street. And he was like, bet. I bet I'll do it again. I'll do it. And again. so he just takes it. And that time they put him in jail for six months. And the yeah. judge said, had you been properly jolted, then it's possible this would not have occurred a second time. Fitzpatrick said he called it the <laughs> lousy drink. <laughs> yeah, he said it was the lousy <laughs> oh, drink. No, that caused yeah. them to Fitzpatrick, attempt to stun. get off the bottle. Quite frankly, if he's Dude. flying that well drunk, I he should just be a pilot. Like that's. That's what I'm saying. Top Gun's got nothing on Fitzpatrick. Oh, he has a drink named after him called Late Night Flight. Hmm. I like that. That's nice. This guy had a purple heart. I think he was. He probably served in the war. No, yeah, I think he was. He was in the military at one point. So, according to his brother, he lied about his age in order to serve in World War II. Base. He ended That's up joining the Marine though. Corps. At fifteen. At fifty. Wow. Base. Fifteen. Okay. At wait. 15. Never mind. What kind of 15-year-old was he? Me at 15? You could mistake me for like an 8-year-old, and that was about <laughs> it. <laughs> like it. Dude. So he ended up being stationed in China. He oh, was... and he learned how to fly over there. Okay, so that that would make sense. And then I guess he was injured because he got a Purple Heart. Hmm. Oh, yeah, he was wounded while driving an ammunition truck to rescue American soldiers trapped by communist fire. What a guy. What a lad. This guy, like, this guy just wow. really, Full really respect based. to the guy. Full respect to this man. Now, wait. That was when he was 15. It had to have been, right? It says he was he was there for two years. So he was, right, so he was so, 17 years old. 
Wow. What a guy. I'm older than this guy, and I have I don't got stuff like that. Dude, I gotta step my game up. What the heck? <laughs> Seriously, like, get on the Fitzpatrick guy, grind. On Fitzpatrick Go steal a plane. Set. What, yes. what color is your single engine plane? <laughs> <laughs> And mine doesn't have a color. Mine is just whichever one I see first. <laughs> That's uh, right. Whichever one is unlucky enough to be unlocked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Whoever <laughs> forgot their keys. Back in 1474, there was a rooster that supposedly did what Wikipedia would call the heinous and unnatural crime of laying an egg. No. And they ended up burning him at the stake. They burned the rooster at the stake. Good. Yes. Yeah. Get rid of that. Oh, yeah. Get, got, rid, of get rid of that. Oh, good riddance. <laughs> so at first I was like, that doesn't make sense. Like, obviously a rooster is not going to lay an egg. So I had to actually look this up. Apparently, very rarely, a chicken can have one of its two ovaries fail. It will still lay eggs because it still has one ovary, but it doesn't develop like a chicken. It develops with like the look of a rooster. So in reality, oh. it was just a chicken that had one failed ovary. Was what right. It, like so it, it, was. it looked like um, a rooster, but it wasn't. And it laid an egg, and people thought it was the devil. Yes, people thought that it would spawn a cockatrice. Snellygaster like... origin. Oh. Matthew, correct me if I'm wrong, just for the people that don't know what a cockatrice is. Yes. It's the the lore was that if a rooster ever committed the heinous and unnatural crime of laying an egg, the egg would spawn like a evil bird thing like Snallygaster, but not quite to that power level. Yeah. It's basically like a chicken mixed with a dragon. It's like a yeah, big nasty, nasty critter, bird. And it's really, really angry. It really sucks, dude. Like Yeah, so bird. if your rooster laid an egg, understandably you'd want to torch that rooster and get rid of the egg there. I guess the only way to to kill him was to basically just burn him in a fire like Corporal Jackie. But um Stop ooh, saying these things too about Corporal Jackie. Soon. Jackson, this is not the type of thing we joke about. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. Dude, like, I... <laughs> where, where is your self-respect? And respect so I... for others? <laughs> no, no. Okay, I want to say that it says that they uh, burned it with as great solemnity as would have been observed in consigning a heretic to the flames, and was witnessed by an immense crowd of townsmen and peasants. So in layman's terms, they were very serious. Yes, they they burned this rooster. <laughs> they got him. So I'm seeing that the rooster was apparently, he was given a trial. I mean, it, it, eventually he was condemned to burn at the stake like the warlock that he was. But um, apparently a case was made for the rooster that because yes. he had like, it wasn't intentional. It just happened to him. He hadn't like hurt anybody or done anything. That, you know, he was not at fault, but uh, no, apparently no, that he, one didn't really, didn't yeah, go far. No, he should have known better. He should have known better. <laughs> he honestly should have known. Yeah, that's disgusting. So this actually, just bizarre trials uh, reminded me of this. Have you guys ever heard of the Salem Tomato Trials? Uh, no. This is... I don't this think is, I have. This is a little... <laughs> it's a little later on in the, the time period. This was... Wait. Is this like the Salem Witch Trials with the Salem Tomato? Yes, yes, the Salem Tomato Trials. So, uh, it was a common belief back in the day. By back in the day, I'm talking like 1800s, late 1700s. It was a common belief that the tomato was poisonous. And oh, yeah. the reason people thought that was A, because of its color, and B, because when you ate it with lead utensils and off of lead plates, the like, I, I don't know, the toxins of the tomato, like soak it in or something. And so you ingest lead and you die. Oh. And so people are like, oh, oh, tomatoes, good heavens. So this was just a common belief even into America. So in the town of Salem, not the same Salem as the Salem witch trials, but a different Salem. There was a man named Colonel Johnson, and this guy was like, guys, tomatoes are not poisonous. I'm telling you, you they're really fine. And no. everybody was like, heretic, tomatoes, you could die just from looking at a tomato. Great, Scott. No. So <laughs> he wanted to prove them wrong. So he got a bucket of tomatoes that he had grown, walked into like the town square, put the tomatoes on trial, 
and just began eating them. And people were like <laughs> going nuts, like no. gathering to see if wow. he would die. And he just he he just sat there and enjoyed his tomatoes he for a little while. Eating tomatoes. And, wait, the crowd cheered. They cheered when he ate tomatoes. And the fireman's band struck up a lively tune, at least according to Wikipedia. Uh, I guess it was what? probably seen as like a spectacle, like a sword swallower. Yeah, everybody was like, like oh my oh, gosh, he's, he's eating, eating tomatoes. tomatoes. Oh. Mad respect to the guy. It is because of this man that we are eating pizza and spaghetti in 2022. That's true. Okay. Yeah, I mean, hats off like, to Colonel Johnson, man. Yeah. Can we just acknowledge... The absolute giga Chad move that Colonel Johnson made here. He did not let society stop him. Thank God for Robert Gibbon Johnson. Colonel Robert Gibbon Johnson. Yeah, seriously. Colonel Johnson out here. Giga Chad. I dare say a tomato on trial. How absurd. How absurd. We could be burning witches at the stake, and instead Uh we're outside the courthouse chomping down on some ripe tomatoes. Such dastardly behavior for these youth. We could be doing such better things with our time. Wait a second. This was way after I thought it was. Oh, this no, was... yeah. This was 1820, I think. Sub- uh, yeah, September this is, 25th, They should 1820. have known better at this point. No, yeah. It, so at this point in history, no. people grew tomatoes for decor. Like, they thought they looked good. And they do. I mean, a, like a tomato plant outside your house. Yeah, they, they look cool. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool looking. But um, did not eat them. Then come in Sigma male Colonel Johnson here. Wait, so we grow like gourds and pumpkins and stuff. And we grow them for decor. I could walk around eating pumpkins and say that it's okay. (laughs) Just take a big juicy bite out of the side of a pumpkin. Pumpkin. Like if I showed up and started eating something that everybody grew for decor, like a pumpkin, nobody's going to go crazy over that. Christmas trees. But start eating. Start Christmas eating trees. a Christmas tree. <laughs> that might make a spectacle. That would make quite the spectacle. I think a pumpkin would make a pretty big splash too. I would eat a Christmas tree. I think it'd be funny. Elmer McCurdy. Let me. I'll just. Paste Elmer it right McCurdy. Here. Who's he? Elmer McCurdy. So, back in you know the Wild West. Okay. He was a bank robber, and he went around robbing banks and robbing from trains, you know, living the classic Wild all West right, life. All right, all right. Okay. The Wild and West then, life. Uh, uh, in 1911, he was shot and killed uh, no. by police, okay, while robbing a train. But that's not where his story ends. See, that's oh? that's only the beginning of the he tale. He started of haunting the train? Uh, no, you see, they, they put his body in a funeral home and um decided that because you know he was a he was a train robber and a bank robber it was kind of important uh they put it on display and people would come to see this body on display oh no uh, oh wait and i know about this guy it became a part of the traveling carnival yeah they would take his body around his body wound up at an amusement park in oh, california oh no <laughs> Yeah, I remember reading about this guy, Elmer McCurdy. And people didn't realize it was a real dude, did they? Yeah, a lot of people thought that he was just like a wax figure or something because of how well he had been mummified and preserved. I just wanted to clarify for anybody that's vomiting in their mouth. It wasn't just like a a corpse. It wasn't just him. He was mummified. mummified. It's still gross. It's still disgusting, but... Yeah. And very this is a pretty, morbid. A pretty but... uh, macabre talk it. <laughs> yeah, a macabre yeah. tale. So I guess was, he was basically more famous after his death. Yes. He so was like, honestly, like... I want to point out it was 1911 that he died. Yeah. He was not buried until 1977. Oh. oh. So his body just kept on getting paraded around all over the place after he died. So his body was taken to, how do you say that, Pahuska, Oklahoma, where it went unclaimed. And then eventually somebody embalmed the body with an arsenic-based preservative, blah, 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 blah. He dressed the corpse in street clothes, placed a rifle in his hands, and stood it up in the corner of the funeral home. For a nickel, he allowed visitors to see the bandit who wouldn't give up. Take a corpse, give him a gun, and charge people a nickel to go see him. Like, hey, you so want to see a the body? The grind never stops. <laughs> yeah. <I guess> like, <laughs> the grind never sleeps. 
So in 1916, five years after he had died, when I guess he was still propped up at this funeral home with a gun in his arms, uh, a man who claimed to be Elmer McCurdy's long lost brother from California arrived. I guess he got permission to take the body and ship it to San Francisco for proper burial. However, it was instead shipped to Arkansas City, Kansas. And the two men that claimed to be his long lost brothers, I guess there were two, uh, they were not his brothers at all. They were were people traveling in a carnival. (laughs) So they were trying to abduct the man's body to bring it to their carnival. So I don't know if they got him back or what happened uh the corpse in 1949 was placed in storage in in a warehouse in la uh it sat there until 1964 what wait okay how many how many years is that uh that's 15 years it sat in storage and then somebody gave the corpse to a filmmaker then he sells the body along with all the other wax figures for ten thousand dollars they put them all on display on a wax museum. And then while he was, you know, on display, he sustained some damage. And um, the people who were running the wax museum <laughs> said that this wax sculpture was a little too gruesome to be displayed. And they they thought he was a wax sculpture? Yep. And they said that he wasn't lifelike enough to be. Yeah, you know, he had no life left. <laughs> yeah, the man had been dead, dead half a century. So, uh, yeah. They uh, basically what? they then sold it to an amusement park called the Pike in California, and um yeah they hung him at a funhouse exhibit at like a dark funhouse. He was just hanging there until then they were like yeah what the frick and decided to bury him. So when did they find out that he was? Oh so they yeah so they found that out because um a production crew was filming a show called the Six Million Dollar Man. While they were shooting it, a prop man moved what he thought was, you know, the wax mannequin on the gallows, and he broke his arm off and found there was, you know, bone and tissue under there. Um, And he was like, wait a second. And uh, everybody was like, wait a second. Dead body reported. (laughs) It was literally like an Among Us reference. They realized that uh, (laughs) something was wrong here. Among Us in real life. Yeah, they determined that, yep, that was... That is the corpse of a of a human person that would have who been was shot to death. Terrible surprise. Yep. Yeah. Surprise. That must have been really like, morbid honestly, like, to find. Imagine yeah, the, the fact that like he broke his arm off and he was just there holding the arm. This has got to be really unsettling. Yeah. Well, maybe it wasn't. Maybe he was like, "Huh, huh. cool arm." Like, oh, look at this, and started like dude. chasing people with it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's brutal. Dude. <laughs> so, how long was uh, he in a wax museum before? Like, how long was he? Like, at? too long. Years. Too um, long. He was on display for a long time, and everyone thought he was wax. Yep, they thought he was a wax sculpture. If you ever feel like you haven't achieved anything in life. Just know that <laughs> just you wait <laughs> after you die, you just might become famous. It might you just take might a few have a story decades. Uh, in this case, we're talking about him over a hundred years after he died, but it could happen. I kind of want to think about like other than just robbing banks and trains, which I guess was kind of like a robbery that was typically cool. involves a threat. It's typically armed, but like other than that, did he do anything really like wrong? Well, let's find out. He was born in Washington, Maine, on January 1st, 1880, so he was a New Year's child. He was born to a 17-year-old woman who was unmarried. Okay. And nobody, he doesn't know who his father was. Okay. He became unruly and rebellious as a teenager, where he formed a habit of drinking heavily, and that habit would continue throughout his life. Um, He couldn't get a job for a while because of his alcoholism. Uh, moved to Missouri, joined the military. Oh, he used nitroglycerin. So McCurdy decided to incorporate his military training with nitroglycerin into his robberies. So he was not subtle. Uh, <laughs> no, he, he, he used explosives in yes. the robberies. Uh, Apparently, according to Wikipedia, he was overzealous and failed to correctly determine the proper amount to use most of the time. Yeah. So I, I guess it got a... Uh, Get a little out of hand here and there. All right, so it says that the extent of his training was likely minimal, so it was likely he just didn't have great oh, okay. training in the army. But huh. he was only a bank robber for, like, a year. Yeah, no, he only... Really, what happened 
was this guy just had a miserable life eventually was like okay go to the military and then when that was over he just became a bank robber for a year and then was killed yeah he went on the uh crime grind as for his specific crimes, it looks like on March 24th, 1911, he and three other men decided to rob a train after he heard one of the cars had a safe with $4,000 in it. They did so successfully. They stopped the train. They got the safe. Um, but he put nitroglycerin on the safe's door, but used a bit too much. And the safe and the majority of the money was destroyed in the blast. So they got like $450 in silver coins, most of which were melted and fused to the safe's frame. So Uh, he he was a little overzealous. So on his final robbery, they heard that there was a train that was taking $400,000 in cash to a um, native reservation. And so they're going to stop this train. And instead, they accidentally stopped a passenger train. Of which they can only steal forty six dollars from the oh, mail clerk. Oh no, that was and some whiskey. Slightly more money back then. Yeah, for, no, it was a yeah, lot. Yeah, but it more wasn't four hundred thousand dollars cash. Not, think that about was a it. Four hundred k in cash back in the day was a lot more than forty six dollars also back in the day. Yeah, this was a significant downgrade. A newspaper called it one of <laughs> the, the smallest of the in the history robbers. of train robbery. Oh, um, that's rough. You know, honestly, yeah, McCurdy though, was this disappointed did not go well. and returned to his ranch where he kept drinking and drinking all the whiskey that he stole. And he also had tuberculosis and pneumonia and trichinosis and just kept on drinking while very sick, apparently. Unknown to him, they knew that he was part of the robbery. No, there, there was, was a, a bounty on his head. reward for his capture. The early hours of the morning, three sheriffs came by, tracked him down with bloodhounds. Uh, and Dude. oh, we have we have a full recollection of the events from one of the sheriffs. Uh, it began just about seven o'clock. We were standing. I I got to do like a proper. Do you want me accent. to give you a, like a, a gritty? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sheriff? Let's 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 hear, let's hear a good impression. Let me see what I can do. Unless Jackson wants to give it a whirl. It began. No, okay. <laughs> That's just disrespectful. Yeah, honestly, you didn't even give him like two yeah. seconds. That's just, I've heard his Western accents before. That just gets shut down immediately. Yeah, man, honestly. Began about seven o'clock. We were standing around waiting for him to come when the first shot was fired at me. It missed me, and then he turned his attention to my brother, Stringer Fenton. What a name, Stringer Fenton. Stringer Fenton, Fenton man, oh, respect. He shot three times at Stringer. And when my brother got undercover, he turned his attention to Dick Wallace. Kept shooting at all of us for about an hour. We fired back every time we could. We do not know who killed him. We found one of the jugs of whiskey, which was taken from the train. It was about empty. He was pretty drunk when we rode up to the ranch last night. So he was killed by a single gunshot wound to the chest, it looks like, which he sustained while laying down. Not sure how that happened. Well, because he, he was up in the loft of the barn, right? Oh, oh, is okay. he up in the loft of a barn? If he was up in the loft. No, he, he says he slept in the hayloft. Hmm. Oh, you know what? Yeah. If he was up in the hayloft and he was laying on his chest. Okay, like so then they would have gone down, in there and, yeah, then they would have gone would in have. there and shot him in the chest. So, uh, in conclusion. Yeah, uh, what have we uh, learned from this story? Yeah, as, as I stated before, if you ever feel like you haven't achieved anything in life and you're just never going to be known, uh, after you die... Your corpse could go on a wild adventure. That's uh, that, true. <laughs> that's important. Yeah, I mean, there is you never there's know, nothing man. stopping. Like, what are you gonna do? Tell them they can't. Like, your, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, your corpse could go. Point. Yeah, like, your corpse could go wherever it's gonna go, man. You never know. Hi again, it's Jesse. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the Deep Lore Boys podcast. You can find more episodes of our show on YouTube and Spotify, which we encourage you to share with your friends so we can grow the podcast. And drop a comment down below if you're feeling extra generous. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope your day is nothing short of interesting. Take care. I'm going to go post that one on Twitter.com.